Good morning, I'm Becky and I'm from the Faculty of Medicine student admin team. And i um, just going to introduce you to our Doctor of Medicine bonding medical plays and student information session, which will be run by um, our colleagues here in the bonded medical team. Oh, that's not working. Oh, there we go. First of all, I'd just like to acknowledge the um, traditional owners and the custodian on the lands of which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country, and we recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. I'd also like to express our firm and proactive commitment to supporting efforts for our greater diversity and inclusion within the faculty and diverse perspectives, abilities, experiences, and backgrounds that inspire creativity, encourage innovation, and enrich our communities. Members of our broad community are valued and respect, uh, respected for their individuality, and UQ strives to create a culturally safe, welcoming, and inclusive place of study with strong community connections and partnerships. So today's session, um, this is just a brief outline of how it's going to run today. So we have two parts of an information session and a Q&A, and then we have some lunch for you about half past one. And I'll introduce Benjamin Batterson, the director of the Bonded Medical Program project team and help for rural doctors and nurse practitioners. And I'll just change over the slide there. Thank you. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are meeting today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'll extend that uh, to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are with us today or indeed are online with us today. Um, it's wonderful to be here at the University of Queensland. Um, I've had quite a nostalgic walk through the campus this morning. Um, it's been 25 years since I graduated at the University of Queensland, so um, my colleagues are going to be sick of me telling them stories about my time here. Um, I kind of joined at uh, a time when the University of Queensland was establishing the Australian arm of the Human Genome Project all those years ago and studied biochemistry here. Um, and, you know, I've gone on my path since then. So it's uh, a wonderful thing to be here at the University of Queensland. And I congratulate you all for uh, firstly, uh, getting your place in a medical program. I know that that takes a lot of hard work and uh, endeavour and uh, indeed uh, your path through uh, the, the course here. And uh, I, I know from the conversations we've had, you, you're really well supported by an engaged faculty um, so we look forward to sharing with you some information about the bonded medical program uh, today and answering any questions that you have. On that note, I've got a number of my colleagues here with me today um, from the Department of Health and Aged Care, the administrators of the program. Um, just so happens that we've got a team uh, here in Brisbane. We've got an office here in Brisbane, in which case a number of our colleagues have taken the opportunity to come. Uh, whilst for the most part, the, we, the senior staff and, and most of the team are in Canberra. So this is number 21 of 21. Um, between myself and uh, a small team, we've now visited every university that offers a bonded place in a medical program. Um, and we've uh, gone to every uh, state and territory other than the Northern Territory um, to, to deliver this uh, information session and to engage with participants, focusing mostly on the 2023 cohort to set you up for success and answer any questions that you have, but also had the opportunity to engage with our uh, participants from previous years in the program and indeed some from the legacy scheme. So um, I might just check in with our slides now and just lead you through what we're hoping to cover today. So we'll start with a little bit about why the this program and the legacy schemes have existed, uh, what the, the government's hoping to achieve um, in, in establishing these programs. We'll work through your obligations as a student 
in the student phase um, of the program, um, how you'll make your way through university and what we would be asking of you during that time. We'll then look at how what your obligations will be once you actually move into the workforce, um, focusing on your return of service obligations and how you'll use our bonded return of service system uh, to achieve that. And then we'll work through some reporting obligations that you will have uh, during your pardon me, during your time in the program. And then I'll look in more detail at where you can do your return of service and how indeed you can go about doing that. Okay. Um, we'll touch briefly on what happens if you withdraw from the program or if you uh, don't complete your return of service and the, the consequences under the program for, for that. Um, and uh, at that point, I'll introduce our colleagues who are here from Health Workforce Queensland, uh, Health Workforce Queensland being the Rural Workforce Agency uh, here in Queensland. And uh, Meredith and Mark will lead you through some of the programs uh, that they run and some of the opportunities for you whilst you're students and once you move into the workforce uh, to get some rural clinical um, um, uh, opportunities and indeed how they can support you to find roles that might uh, uh, support you to complete your return of service. So that's a little bit of an introduction. Um, and then we, we'll, given that we've got a pretty big crowd, we'll probably work through those presentations and then we'll answer any questions that you have in a Q&A. And I note that we've got quite a number of people who are online, some of whom are administrators as well. And so we'll just work through those questions. So Becky's going to help us with those online questions um, and we can work through. And I'm happy to stay for as long as you've got questions. Um, we'll, we'll provide answers to those questions. And in some cases, we might lead you to some other support to, uh, to, um, to, to follow up on, on your knowledge about the program as you go through. Okay, everybody happy with that? Yeah, good stuff. So can I just ask as a starting point, just a show of hands, who is starting out in their first year in 2023? Okay, great, most of you. Who's in their second, third or fourth year at, in the medical program here? Okay, um, is anybody here in an undergraduate are you studying undergraduate degree? Okay. I haven't seen a few hands come up yet. So is anybody, was anybody joined a program in 2019 or earlier? Okay, great. So we do have a couple of legacy scheme participants and that will make more sense that term in a minute. But I'm guessing that you joined the bonded medical places scheme in 2019 or before and you've deferred or you've just taken an, an extra year to move through the program. Okay, that's great. All right, so that's good for me just to have the, the specifics and uh, I'll be able to frame how we go through the presentation um, from here on in. Okay, so let's start with what the purpose of these programs uh, have been. So starting in 2001, the government established the Medical Rural Bonded Scholarship Scheme. Okay. And so that that scheme originally provided a Commonwealth supported place and it did have a scholarship element. It had a, a an amount of a scholarship that was a roughly equivalent to HEX, right? And that that HEX amount was actually significantly more than it is now. You know, there's been quite a significant reduction in the HEX component for the a medical course. Um, in which case, yes, it did have a scholarship component but it also had a length of return of service of six years, all right? So there's a bit of a quid pro quo there, okay? And so those that program started in 2001 and ran until 2015, and there was roughly 100 scholarships offered, all right? And rough, on average, about 85 of those were taken up. So about we've got about 11, 1,100 participants over the course of that 2001 to 2015, okay? In 2004, the 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 government the federal government and in a partnership with the state governments there's an agreement reached to dramatically expand the number of medical places um, that were offered and funded by the government state governments undertook to actually invest in more rural clinical placements and training opportunities and the federal government invested in substantially more commonwealth supported places and a number of those were bonded, allocated as bonded places, okay? So the intent being with these 
legacy schemes from the origin was that this would be a structural mechanism to ensure that we had more doctors practicing in rural locations, rural, remote, very remote locations, in which case this is a program that complements other incentive programs in order to improve access to health services in those regional, rural and remote locations. And it's consistent with how we operate in Australia, trying to get equitable access to services, whether it's hospitals, schools, you know, NBN, et cetera. Okay, so it's a, the, the burden of having a large country and a dispersed population. So those two programs, the Medical Rural Bonded Scholarship Scheme and the Bonded Medical Places Scheme are what we refer to as legacy schemes. Okay, and I'll come, I'll, I'll touch on those a couple of times, just so you've got an awareness of it, but also because we've got some participants in that program. Those legacy scheme participants can voluntarily opt in to the statutory program. Okay, clearly the statutory program is what we're going to be focusing on this morning and in, in this, because that's for the majority. Anybody who joined from 2020 when the program was established will come straight into the program. And so going forward, it will be the bonded medical program and you'll have a three-year return of service and you'll use the bonded return of service system in order to um, self-navigate and participate through the program. Okay? But those legacy scheme participants, some 12,000 doctors, students who actually have individual contracts with the Commonwealth, that's what we're seeking to actually transition to the single program going forward okay so legacy scheme participants can opt in new students join the program proper okay so moving into what are your obligations in the student phase so we've talked to the faculty today we know that there's at, at the university of queensland there's been a range of different pathways into the medical program whether it was an undergraduate or a postgraduate um, uh, avenue. Understand that most of the first years are actually postgraduates and you're actually coming into that, that program. And, and indeed, in future years, you'll spend some time in clinic, uh, rural, rural settings in, in doing some of your studies. That's a wonderful initiative that we're you know, getting you out into those uh, rural locations um, early on. Um, so the, in the student phase, your obligation, first of all, I think that you've all, have you all received your BROS login details? Not yet. Okay, so it's, yeah, that's okay. It's all, all good. So over the course of these couple of months, all of the universities have been finalising their places. Some people don't take up a place, in which case a new person gets offered a place. And so all of that admin kind of gets sorted out in this next couple of weeks. And so the department, sorry, the, the university admin staff will load your details into the bonded return of service system and once that's done, the department then will send you your login details. And it, the first thing you'll do when you first log in, it will present you with the request for you to formally accept your place in the bonded medical program. So you've clearly identified your intent to study medicine and your, your place to study medicine is linked to you accepting that um, place in the bonded medical program. So that's the formality for you to be bonded essentially under the legislation. So where you see references to the Health Insurance Act and then the bonded medical program rule, these are essentially how government programs are established. They, when there's a consequence for you or there's a requirement for you to do something, it needs to be established in a primary act. And for health programs, that's often the Health Insurance Act. And then that act actually enables the secondary legislation for the Minister for Health to issue the bonded medical program rule. And then that sets out the specifics of how the program will run and how you will interact and what you need to do. And indeed, how the department will administer the program. And so this is really the last time I'll refer to the act and the rule, because we've taken that information and translated it into our information booklets and the material that I'm presenting today is all consistent with the material that's on our website that you'll mostly engage with. And indeed, before the end of the session today, take one of these cards or just open your camera and snap the QR code, which will take you directly into the the bonded medical program page for prospective students and all of the information and and just the reinforcement of what we're, we're talking about today will be there for you okay and indeed there's a slightly different card which is for legacy scheme participants so 
legacy scheme participants and this information will support you to understand the program and indeed the difference between your that and your legacy scheme and how how you might consider opting into the program and and what you'll be subject to thereafter okay so slightly different but a, a qr code that takes you directly and we encourage you to always come back to the department's website as the source of truth rather than printing anything that might go out of date it's just great to have that bookmark of our our page and then return to that so that you can you can get an update on on things that are happening okay and we'll update things over time so you're in the student phase you're assuming that you're going to accept that place you continue studying medicine and thereafter your key responsibility between now and when you finish your course of study is just to complete your course in accordance with the university's rules so the university determines whether or not you can take a deferral or you know whether you just continue on the university might require you to complete a, a re, re sit an exam or reset a unit or do a clinical placement in accordance with you know their guidelines and 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 the rules of the course and as long as you are completing your course in accordance with the university's rules we're happy okay um in which case through the student phase, literally, there's a few reporting obligations whereby you need to obviously log into the bonded returner service system, accept your place, and thereafter you need to log in every six months. And it literally will take you five minutes every six months for those four years to meet your obligations. All right. In your last year of study, there's a few other things to do because that's the time that you'll be hopefully building a relationship with the rural workforce agency and understanding what your opportunities can be in the in when you when you get out into your your first work um in your intern year and how you can actually start your rozo in that first year so there's a bit of a planning aspect and i'll talk through that in a, in a little while all right so yeah pretty simple complete your course of study in accordance with well accept your place given that that's going to happen in the next few weeks Complete your course of study in accordance with the rules of your university. Log into BROS every six months, five minutes, complete your obligations and update us and just confirm that you're on part on track. And then in that last year, transition into a planning phase for how you're going to complete your return of service. Okay. So you've already met these obligations by being offered a place. Okay. All of our material, you'll see that it says prospective medical students so over the course of time we've improved all of our materials so that they're all relevant to you as new participants but what we want to do is actually push out and in 2024 before the 2024 cohort we want to get the, the people who might be considering studying medicine so where you folks were six months ago perhaps or 12 months ago where you're thinking i want to i want to study medicine where am i going to study medicine what does the program look like we want people to be aware that in Australia, you might be offered a bonded place. And indeed, what would that mean? Okay, so we want to get this information to people a little bit earlier, just so that they, they are informed coming into when they get that, that offer of a bonded place, they're already familiar with what that means. Not to the depth that we will get into today, but just roughly that there are some non-bonded place and there are some bonded place. And what does it mean? How do you have to, how will you have to complete that return of service? Okay. so that's why it says prospective student but it's all relevant to you and for the most part for those folks that are in a legacy scheme most of what i'll say from now on is all relevant to you once you move into the program okay but i will answer specific questions that you might have um, after the session because of course that won't be relevant to the majority of the people here but happy to spend the time with your folks to to make sure that your your questions are answered okay so that's when you're our student and how you get that place originally i might also add that the university determines the who gets offered what place and how that comes to be okay so as postgraduates i think you've all sat the gamsat and you've had a score through that you've probably had interviews and there's probably some other elements that you know the university can outline as to how they come up with the the different um you know rankings and and thereafter who's who's offered what kind of place so if you've got questions about that process then you'll be able to direct them to the admin staff and they'll be able to provide you with some answers but essentially once the university loads those the the, the names of who has been offered a place into the bonded returner service system that's where we pick up and start to administer you as a as a participant 
Okay, moving through. Oh, my clicker has stopped working. Doesn't like me anymore. A bit odd. Is it all right? I just, oh yeah, it just went to sleep. Okay, so as I said earlier, anybody who's in a legacy scheme can voluntarily opt into the program. And I might just skip forward because I can talk about this in a little bit more detail with those legacy scheme participants later on, okay? But just to be clear, if you are ever on a page that says legacy scheme participant, for the majority of you, that's not relevant to you and you need to navigate back out to the prospective student information, okay? All right, so your obligations. I've talked a little bit about completing your course of study in medicine, okay? I've really light touch on uh, your return of service obligation being three years in 18. And I'll come back to that in a minute. And then I've talked a little bit about your reporting obligations, which I'll go into a little bit in, in a little bit more detail. Okay. So essentially under the legacy schemes, as I said, the original one had a return of service of six years. The bonded medical places scheme has a return of service of the length of your degree. So if you're a postgraduate medical student here, four years, okay? So roughly your return of service would be four years and slightly different for some cohorts, okay? In particular years, okay? So the return of service obligation and the rules of how you can complete that has changed quite significantly over time. The program, those two schemes have been operating for 20 years, roughly. And there were some 30 different variations of those individual contracts. So we've worked through that and there was a review done of those schemes and then the bonded medical program was designed with a return of service of three years and that legacy scheme participants could opt into the new program and carry forward their return of service obligation. So whatever the length of service was previously, you would carry it forward and if it was greater than three years, you would only have to do three years in the program. So quite, a, quite an incentive to move from those legacy schemes into the new scheme. Part of that was to make the program simpler and part of it was to dramatically reduce the administration on participants and on the, on the department so that we could start to make some efficiencies and invest in other programs like the ones that the Rural Workforce Agency run, okay? So as far as the program is concerned, the bonded medical program, you have a return of service of three years to be completed in 18 years, okay? Why 18 years? Well, 18 years is because we don't require you to only work in eligible locations. You can do as much work as you like in ineligible locations, provided that you end up doing the three years of ROSO within the 18. We don't ask you to apply for leave. We don't ask you to apply for maternity or paternity leave, for example. The 18 years reflects that life will happen for you and as long as you are planning to do your return of service, we want to make it as easy for you as possible and with as lower, lower administration as possible, okay? So you've got those 18 years to complete your return of service. There are some circumstances in which you can get an extension. If you have a medical issue for you or for a family member, then you can seek to get an extension for a period of time, okay? Um, and think of somebody who's caring for a very terminally ill kind of parent or something like that, you know, where you take a year out and, you know, you could perhaps apply for uh, an extension on medical grounds or something like that, okay? And similarly, if something significant happens in your life whereby you're not able to complete your studies or you're not able to continue working as a doctor, an example used in the parliament was a, a, a student that has a surfing accident, breaks their neck and can't complete their course of study you can now apply for an ex exceptional circumstances determination. And if that's granted by the secretary, then you can be released from your obligation. So those two things are, are the, the mechanisms by which you can get some relief. But by and large, most of you will complete three years return of service in 18 or less and will be done, okay? The way to think about, oh, I've got my clicker in my pocket now. Okay, so moving through, uh, I've mentioned a little bit the bonded return of service system. So this was also part of the establishment of the new program was to provide you with an online system where you will be able to log in, you'll be able to 
track your reporting obligations simply, you'll be able to plan your return of service and you'll be able to demonstrate the evidence that you've completed your return of service all in the one simple system. And you'll be able to track your progress towards completing your return of service obligations. Okay. And the system will alert us that you have completed your obligations and we send you a nice certificate. If you would appreciate something other than a certificate, let us know and we'll see what we can do. Okay. Some other cohorts have suggested that maybe we'll design a special emoji or a, 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 some kind of electronic card that has some fireworks or something like that. But in, at the moment, it's a certificate. Okay. Um, in any case, that's the bonded return of service system. And you'll know more about that once you get your logon details and you jump into the system. First, you'll actually accept your place. But it's got in-system guidance that will help you navigate through the program and you'll be able to see different information. And there's always the support from the department. Okay, We've also got a webinar up online where one of our staff actually leads you through the different pages and how you'll actually navigate through the system, right? Like a YouTube type video of how to use the system. And we'll be seeking to update those as further functionality comes out online for the bonded return of service system. Okay, so when, where, and how to complete your ROSO, okay? We're far more flexible. Um, and I'll just stick a pin in this because there are some obligations for those bonded medical places scheme participants that if you do opt into the program, slightly different to you, but I'll answer those questions for you specifically. So um, some of the flexibility for other program participants isn't available for you coming into the program given your return of service um, details. But in any case, for the most part, you have a three-year return of service, but you should think of that as 156 one-week blocks, okay? Because you earn ROSO after you do an amount of effort in a time period, and once you've done that, you get credited with one week of ROSO, okay? One week, two weeks, 155, 156, and you're done, okay? And that'll make more sense with some of the examples that I'll use, but you can work on a full-time basis, a part-time basis, on a per-day basis, you can fly in, fly out, you can do a locum of two weeks, yeah? You can do an hour of work in a clinic every Friday and have that ball accrue towards your return of service, if that's the way you wanna work, okay? And I'm gonna lead you through all of those arrangements, different arrangements now, okay? Ideally, we're making it as flexible for you as possible and as administratively well, less administratively burdensome for you, because if we can achieve that, then it's it's less administratively burdensome for us in the department, okay? And so wherever possible, we're trying to support you to achieve your return of service, okay? Within the intent of the program, which is of course, to get doctors out into regional, remote and very remote Australia. All right, you'll see this graphic comes straight out of our information booklet, okay? And this is essentially telling you how you can complete your return of service. I'm going to start here at 20 hours per week, the part time. Okay. If you are working week in, week out in your intern year and you are doing 20 hours a week in an eligible location, okay, we'll come to eligible locations. But once you've done 20 hours a week, you get credited with a week of ROSA. Okay. So that's essentially the first threshold to get a week of ROSO is 20 hours in a week. Sunday through Saturday, if you've done 20 hours of eligible work in an eligible location, you'll get given, you'll get credited with a week of ROSO. So one of those 156 weeks, okay? If you work at least 35 hours in a week, then it's a full-time week. And that becomes important if you're working in an MM4 to 7 location. So the modified Monash model being a mechanism to determine how remote an area is, modified Monash 7 being the most remote through to modified Monash 1 in a metro being clearly the least remote. Okay. In a metro through to MM7. I'll talk about how that makes, um, how that, how, how that is determined as to eligible locations in a minute. But essentially, if you work 35 hours a week for 104 of those 156 weeks, so if you build up credits working full-time 
in an MM4 to 7 location and you, you, you do 104 weeks on that basis, then in the rest of your work, when you continue to work full time in an MM4 to 7 location, essentially you get two for one. Okay. So you do 104 weeks on a full time basis in an MM4, and then your 105th week counts as two, and your 107th week counts as two all the way through. In a, and in essence, you will only end up doing 130 weeks of return of service instead of 156. Yeah, because those 26 weeks, if you continue working full time, will count as 52 each week. Okay, does that all make sense? Yeah. And so that's really the only difference between what is a part time week and what is a full time week. For the most part, in your intern year, if it's in an eligible location, you'll be working a whole lot more hours than 35 hours a week, right? In which case, if it's in an MM2, 3, location then it will be credited as a full-time week but if it's in a four to seven then you'll start to build up these credits on a full-time basis towards that scaling benefit okay so these are things to think about when you're thinking about where am i going to start off my working career okay because you can literally start your return of service on day one of your internship okay if you're in an eligible location etc okay so that's the part-time and full-time you're also able to work on a what's called a per day basis, okay? So that's when in a week of Sunday through Saturday, you haven't achieved 20 hours, okay? You essentially, if you, let's think about a, we wanted to make sure that we were um, recognizing the valuable work that can be done in the health system by people who are working more flexibly or a lower number of hours, okay? So let's think about a woman who's had a child and is returning to the workforce, okay? Let's say that that woman does three, four-hour shifts, a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, because that's what fits with her family responsibilities and, and her interest and the clinic's happy for her to do that work, et cetera, okay? So four, eight, 12 hours in that week. It's not 20 hours, in which case she doesn't get a part-time week. Those 12 hours get banked. And then in the second week, assuming that that's her roster is three, four hour shifts a week, the Monday, four hours, the Wednesday, four hours, those eight hours pair with these 12 hours. And now we've got 20 hours in a period longer than a week. And that particular woman on, working on that basis would be credited a week of Rosso on a per day basis. And then her Friday shift of four hours starts the, the process again. Okay, But the system is smart enough to know that if in this first week, that woman, let's call her Susie, Susie works 4, 8, 12 on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, she's got 12 hours. But if she gets called in to do another shift on the Saturday to cover for one of her colleagues, and it's an eight hour shift, she completes that shift on the Saturday. Now she's got 4, 8, 12, 20, and she gets credited a week of Rosso on a part-time basis. Yeah, And then all of the shifts in the second week, the 4, 8, 12, gets banked towards a per day basis. Okay, So essentially, in the bonded return of service system, you folks will probably, let's just say that in your internship, you're in an eligible location, you're doing clinical work, it's all going to count. You'll probably say, here's my return of service plan, which we'll get to, and here's the evidence of my employment contract for the year. And then down the track, you'll come back and confirm that, yes, I did that work. And then you'll get credited a week, well, 52 weeks of Rosso on a, whatever it is, part-time or per day, uh, sorry, full-time basis. And your admin will be pretty low, right? Because you'll have those interactions over the course of, of months. The system will allow you to track any work that you do. It's just that your admin will be a little bit higher if you're doing lots of shifts and if you're working in different clinics and if you're working in different locations, okay? So if you stay on top of what your engagements are and load that evidence into the system, it will be able to track it, yeah? You're not restricted to only work on a part-time or a full-time or a per day. You can do a mix of that through the course of your, your engagement, okay? And indeed, you might do, you might do two, two engagements where on a Monday, you're working in a clinic for 10 hours and on a Friday, you work in a different clinic in a different location for 10 hours, those two combined will be a part-time week, yeah? 
or you can work a Friday each week. You can live here in Brisbane in an MM1, but you could travel out to Toowoomba. I'm hoping Toowoomba is an MM2 plus. Good. Okay. Just check in. I've got to be careful with my examples. I've been doing this all over Australia. Uh, in which case, you could live in Brisbane and travel out one day a week and do a 10 hour um, shift in a clinic in Toowoomba and do that one day a week. In which case, 10 hours in the first week, 10 hours in the second week, those get paired together and you'd get a part time week each fortnight. Yeah. And that's the way the system can help you track it. Yeah. We, of course, would prefer that you make the most of a rural clinical placement, establish yourself in a rural location, become a rural GP, and stay there forever. Okay? But we recognize there's a whole lot of different pathways. Okay? So I'm going to talk now about when you can complete your return of service. And there, there are some elements. Remember when I started out to say, in under the Medical Rural Bonded Scholarship Scheme, that original program, it had a six-year return of service, and you couldn't start your return of service until you'd achieved fellowship, as in you became a fellow and specialised, right? Minted as a GP or an other specialist. So they had a six-year degree <laughs> and then another seven, six, seven, up to 12 years before they could even start their return of service. Yeah? Crazy, right? We changed that. So under the bonded medical program, you can now do half of your return of service. So for prospective students joining the program, up to 18 months or 78 weeks, it's help, more helpful to think of, right? So 78 weeks you can do in your pre-fellowship phase. Okay, remembering that if you're in an eligible location, you can do those 78 weeks in your se first 78 weeks of work if you're in an eligible location. Intern, residency, and you hit that cap, you can do it in the first 78 weeks or you can spread it out however you want to do it. But you can only do 78 or half of your return of service in the pre-fellowship phase. And then you come back to an eligible location once you've achieved fellowship and complete the other 78 or the other the, the second half. Okay. The thinking being that we want to have new or young, for the most part, young doctors establishing themselves in rural medicine, right? And rewarding you for doing that early by allowing you to do your return of service early. But we also want to get enough experienced and specialist doctors operating in the bush, in which case this is a structural mechanism to balance both of those. Okay. And so you can do half of your return of service in the first, um, you know, before fellowship and half after fellowship. Yeah. But then we've got a bit of a complication because there's lots of people, lots of doctors who have a really rewarding career and an interest in only working in the hospital system as a generalist, okay? Never intended to specialise. Yeah. Then we have some folks who have difficulty getting onto their preferred specialty pathway because it's really quite competitive, yeah? And then we have some people who do manage to get onto that pathway, but then have difficulty for a range of reasons to actually complete the program, yeah? In which case, those three examples don't achieve fellowship. In which case, we need a different mechanism to support you to do the rest of your return of service. And the way we do that is that once you achieve, once you get to the, the, the timeline, on the timeline, 12 years after you complete your course of study in medicine, any work that you do can count as return of service, okay? So what that means is you're not, you don't have to do any pre-fellowship return of service. Of course, I would like you to because I want you to establish and live forever in a rural location as a rural GP, okay? But... You could make up your mind that in your plan, your plan is to say, you know what, I'm going to go and travel the world. I'm going to go and work in exotic locations. I'm going to work in aid programs, whatever, right? You can do any of that. You're never restricted to do ineligible work. That's up to you, okay? You might say, okay, I'm going to do nothing until the 12-year mark, and then I'm going to start. I'm going to move to Monto, right? Monto's an MM5, right? And I'm going to start working full time. I'm going to build up my 104 credits. And then in my third year, I'm going to work two for one. 
right? And then I'm going to complete my return of service that way as a rural generalist. Okay, you could do that. The challenge with that, though, is if I think about the last 12 years of my life, right? I've got an 11-year-old daughter. I've got a nine-year-old son. I've been married for best part of 10 years, 11 years, okay? I met my wife. I hated my life. No, not really. Yeah. I graduated from the University of Queensland. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of years in my life. Okay. But think about these next 12 years of your life. Well, the next 18 years of your life, right? You have four years of uni and then you get to that 12 year mark. That's a lot of years and it's a lot of life events. Okay. And so that's fine if your plan is solid, but it's going to get increasingly more difficult for you to extract whatever your life has got to to actually then move to an eligible location and pick things up. And the pressure will mount on you to complete your return of service. If you've got a partner, if you've got a family, if you've got a mortgage, if you've got a particular job that you, you know, that you don't want to leave immediately, right? Because this kind of gets into what's the consequence of getting to that 18th year and not having done your return of service. Yeah. So that's why we encourage you to get out early to start doing your return of service early and to bank that first 18 months as early as possible, right? And to leave your options open such that when life happens, you can, you know, change. If you work as a GP or a rural generalist, there's lots of opportunities for you to complete your return of service. Yeah, almost any job that you do outside of a, in a metro location will probably be eligible, right? But if you specialize and go into an example I keep returning to is neurosurgery, yeah, where you become a cardiothoracic physician and these kind of roles are always in a tertiary hospital in an inner metro location, then yes, you are going to in increasingly diminish your options to get your cho chosen work in your chosen location. Okay, so it's just factoring that in, yeah, and thinking about that. Okay. Summarize. Essentially, the benchmark is to do 20 hours a week. Once you're doing 20 hours a week, you'll be credited a week of Rosa. Work 35 hours a week or more and in an MM4-7 to seven and get access to scaling benefits. There's lots of flexibility, but noting that the administration on you will increase a little bit as well to, to maintain the records and provide the system with the evidence that you require. I might add that if you ever can't find the evidence or sometimes some employ employers you know, it's an administrative burden on them for them to provide you the evidence. You can always submit a statutory declaration. I'm Benjamin Batterson. I worked in X from A to B, et cetera. Here's my statutory declaration. That will be enough evidence, okay? There's consequences for making a false declaration, but you don't need to worry about that. You all look like honest folk. Okay, so lots of flexibility. You can do half before fellowship. You have to do half after fellowship. But once you get to 12 years, any work that you do that's eligible can count. Okay? All right. Good. So, summary. Your reporting obligations. For the most part, we want you to stay in touch. Okay? Get into BROS early. Look around. Maybe look at that webinar. It's like 20 minutes. It'll lead you through. You'll understand how to work with the system accept your place, and then every six months, log back in literally five months, sorry, five months, five minutes every six months. We'll complete it. If you haven't changed your name, if you haven't changed your contact details, it's going to be even easier still, right? If you haven't deferred and you're still on the same path, literally you'll be logging in saying, it's all the same, out again, right? Keep up to date, okay? One thing about the contact details, at the moment, you're probably interacting a lot with a student email that the, the university provides you. That's going to be, you lose access to that as soon as you graduate, right? So it's not going to be a helpful email to, to navigate through the system. And you'll, if you keep doing that with your student email and then your first job email and your second job email, et cetera, you'll have to keep going back and returning it. You might consider establishing one email address, first name dot last name at provider of choice, 
and just using that as your admin email address, whether it's for the bond of return of service system or you know, logging in with the in getting on the distribution list for the rural workforce agency or other staff. If you have that email, it'll be enduring and you won't ever have to worry about updating your contact details. Yeah. We have a bit of a laugh in the department when we have to interact with Hootie McBoob 71. Okay. So it's another consideration as how you're presenting yourself to the world, but that's for you, okay, to decide. So simple, stay in touch, keep up to date with your contact details or use enduring contact details, okay? Similarly, update us when you meet milestones and the different evidences that you provide, and then we'll move into the registering a re return of service plan. So this slide here is more the kind of format that you see in that bonded medical program rule, where it specifies the things that you have to do, okay? And indeed in the rule, it talks about the deadlines that you need to do it within. Okay, but for the most part, it talks about every six months logging into BROS and confirming these things, whether you've changed your name, whether you've got changes of your details, and indeed, if you've changed any impacts, sorry, if you've had any changes to the trajectory of your completion of your course of study in medicine. That's important because we want to know when you're in that last year, the last six months, because that's when our support really ramps up to support you through the ROSA return of service planning. And indeed, that's where the Rural Workforce Agency really kicks in in helping you find roles that will uh, uh, help you to achieve your return of service, okay? In which case, that's a requirement. Then these things happen over the course of years thereafter. You complete your course of study, you get your provisional registration, start and finish your internship, and you get your general registration, well, after, you know, start your vocational training if that's your interest, and then you get your medical specialization, all right? Pretty simple stuff. Then we move into the other return of service obligation, okay? So before the day that you complete your course of study, you have to have at least one return of service plan in the BROS system, okay? Like I said, your plan might be that on, what are we, four years, so 2023 through 2027, right? And then 12, in 2039, the 1st of January, 2039, I'm moving to, where did we say, Monto, MM5, okay? That could be your plan. Monto will almost certainly remain an eligible location. Not almost certainly, it will. There's 1,300 people in Monto, yeah? There's a small hospital that's run by two doctors, one of whom until recently was my younger brother, okay? So... Monto is the place for you as a rural generalist, yeah? That might be your plan, or it might be four years, 2027, 1st of January, 2027, I'm going to work at the Toowoomba Hospital, yeah? Great, yeah? Start rural early. In which case, once you've got that plan, and you might have multiple plans, by the way, you might say, oh, I'm thinking about this role, I'm thinking about that role, I'm thinking about that role, they're all eligible locations, I just haven't got confirmation of where I'm heading yet, yeah? And so when you load those three plans, five plans, 27 plans into BROS, most of them will fall away when you confirm that you've got one particular job, yeah? And then you confirm that with your employment contract, probably, yeah, in that early phase, and then after a while you've started work, you confirm that and you'll see your progress bar of completed ROSO start to track, yeah? It is possible that you might encounter bugs in the bonded return of service system. It's an IT system like any other, okay? So if something doesn't look right to you, it may not be right, in which case, please let us know so that we can fix it as soon as possible, okay? Or if you find it difficult to navigate for whatever else, give us that feedback and we'll consider whether or not other people are gonna possibly have the same challenges and we can, we can seek to add that functionality or change that functionality, okay? All right, eligible work versus ineligible work, okay? The way I think about this, and this is a long way down the track, given that so many of you have still got so much study to do. The way I think about this is if it's patient-facing, health service delivery, clinical, it's probably gonna be eligible if that's the majority of your role, okay? Versus if it's a research uh, position, it's administrative, it's not patient facing, it's unlikely to be eligible work, 
Okay. While I was in WA, some of the, while I was in WA, I think it was at Notre Dame University, they were saying that the WA intern and residency contracts require them to participate in some research activities. Yeah. In which case they were, oh, does that mean that that won't be eligible? And we came to the conclusion, and this is something that we would always need to test. Yeah. What's the majority of your work focus? Yeah. In which case, clearly, the majority of their work focus is going to be in seeing patients and training, but in that clinical environment. Okay. And it's a great thing that they participate in research and get a, a bit of an understanding of how you might support, you know, future developments of medicine, et cetera. And so that was a minor element of their work, in which case we assumed that they would probably be doing well in advance of 35 clinical focused work and a marginal amount of research. Okay. But these are the things that it's always good to test. Yeah. If the location is somewhat questionable, right, then get a ruling ruling from the department that you can rely on in writing that goes onto your bond of return of service plan. Yeah. Your your file. And similarly the type of work that you're doing, get a ruling, in which case then you can be confident that you're doing eligible work. Happy with that? Okay. So eligible, probably eligible would be clinical patient-facing service delivery versus unlikely research, admin, et cetera. Okay. All right. Where can you work? So the first point is, once you've graduated and once you've got a return of service plan loaded into the system, you're not prevented from doing anything, okay? You can go to London, you can work in a metro, you can do whatever you please, right? You don't even have to work, right? Provided that by the time we get to that 18th year, post your completion of your course of study, you've done 156 weeks of ROSA, right? So that's the first step. You can work anywhere. But for your work to be eligible, it has to be in an MM2 to 7 location. And in a second, I'm going to show you a map of just how close to here you can work and for it to be eligible, right? So let's focus first on MM2 to 7, okay? There's a f that's always going to be eligible, right? I'm going to lead you through a few other things, which are point of entry locations and quarantine locations and explain that. And I'm also going to talk about districts of workforce shortage for non-GP specialties and distribution priority areas for GP specialties. And I'll explain that as well. But let's stick for the starting point because for the most part, for you folks in those early years, pre-fellowship, pre-vocational training, it's going to be MM2 to 7 that governs whether a location is eligible. Okay? And we'll come to the rest in a minute. So here's a map, okay? And you'll see here, 288 Hurston Road, I think is the closest that we thought we could get to this lecture theatre, okay? Um, it's an MM1, so you can't set up your shingle here for it to be eligible work. But on this scale, 20 kilometres, right, and this colour coding, these pink areas here, right, which are literally... 15 kilometers from where we are, you start to get into this band of eligible areas. So that's MM2, the light pink, these ones here. The little purple is out to MM4. So that would be the first location, the MM4. These would become eligible for that full-time credits towards scaling. And all of this green is all MM5. So it doesn't necessarily go out like a rainbow where you've got MM1, MM2, MM3, MM4, et cetera. Sometimes you jump straight out from, you know, if you if this map, if I had the map, because this is specific, obviously, to University of Queensland here, but yesterday I was in Townsville and it's like Townsville ML2, everything MM5, right? So literally eligible for scaling. Eligible work, eligible for scaling, right? And so it's always important that you're working on the street address and the number of where you're working because it's a bit like electoral boundaries, yeah? They shift over time as we get changes in the distribution of the popula population. So think of, you know, I don't know if you're familiar, but Greater Western Sydney, 
if you looked at what Greater Western Sydney was allocated 15 years ago compared to what it is now, it's probably gone from MM4, 5 to being MM1, right? In that centre of kind of Parramatta kind of area, okay? So these things shift over time and it's always important to put in the street address to get the specifics of whether it's eligible or not. So this map that we're looking at now is the online open to the public health locator tool, right? Health workforce locator tool. Now, all these buttons, all these tick boxes up in this top left-hand corner, those are all the different tick boxes that you need to know which box to tick if you're a legacy scheme participant to understand the specific rules that are relevant to your engagement in the legacy scheme, okay? And if you get that wrong, then the tool is not giving you the correct answer for your scheme, okay? But you folks, for the most part, don't have to worry about any of that because the tool has been recreated inside of the bonded return of service system, right? And when you're inside of BROS, it knows all the rules of the program. And indeed it knows your specific circumstances when it comes to those point of entry and quarantine locations I'm gonna speak about in a minute and the DPA and DWS areas such that it will always give you a correct answer, yeah? And if it's gray, it might lead you to, for a follow-up from the department and the department will give you a confirmation, okay? So always do this inside of BROS, right? If you wanna have a bit of a play in the next two weeks, it might be a bit sad, you could go to the pub instead, right? Hang out for two weeks until you get your log on details and then just like go into BROS, okay? But if you're desperate, you can go online and you can have a bit of a play with this. And if you, where you grew up, I don't know if you traveled, maybe you came from, you know, you maybe you grew up in Milmerin, Mil right? A little bit further Northwest of Toowoomba, right? Another place my brother's worked. I just know these names because he's worked in these locations, okay? In which case, you know, you can play, but just wait for BROS. You'll get inside BROS. You'll always get the right answer, okay? So let's talk a little bit now about what these other concepts are that I've talked about, all right? The first is that, um, actually, no, I'm just going to back up. Sorry. So if you're on a GP pathway, essentially, there's this concept of a distribution priority area, Okay. And so what this is essentially saying is outside of the modified Monash model, okay, a particular location has a lower than the national benchmark for health practitioners operating in that area, right? So there's not enough GPs in that area. In which case, if that's the case, for a period of time, that location can be designated a distribution priority area. And what that means is that participants of bonded programs and some overseas trained doctors that have restrictions on where they can practice may be able to operate in that area, okay? The goal being that the number of health practitioners goes up and if we're successful in attracting somebody to work in that area, then they lose the status, okay? Pretty simple way of dealing with the mechanics of having enough uh, health practitioners in a particular location. So that's a distribution priority area for a GP, right? The same concept roughly for non-GP specialties is called a district of workforce shortage, DWS, okay? And so this becomes important to you because later, remember how I said that MM7 through two, you can always work, right? So that everywhere is eligible locations, yeah? Sensibly, in a metro, like where we are right now, you'll never be able to work. So MM1 in a metro, you'll never be able to work. But in that gray area where it's MM1 but outer metro, so if we look at the map, it's kind of this is the inner metro, and then there's kind of like an invisible line through this light green area, which is the boundary between inner metro and outer metro. So where a location is designated outer metro, and it's DPA or DWS, then it would be eligible for you to do work, okay? And so the map will always know its status based on DPA or DWS, you yeah? know? 
And that becomes really beneficial to you down the track because as soon as you, when you get your BROS logon details and you click that button that says, I accept, on that day, any location that's eligible, MM2 to 7 and those outer metro DPA DWS locations become your point of entry locations. And they will remain eligible for you for the length of your engagement in the program. Okay, on the day you tick that button and join the program or on the day after the day the secretary agrees to your participation and you become a bonded participant, if you're coming in from a legacy scheme, that's your point of entry. And so all those locations would be eligible. Okay, thereafter, if there's a change to the modified Monash, and so if you look at the, if you look at this, the modified Monash model started in 2015, it got updated in 2019. Okay, if you're doing basic kind of patterns in math, you could see that it's probably almost due for an update, right? Hasn't happened yet, but it might soon, right? Because the census data is just being released and it's just working its way through, okay? So if you click that box before the release comes out, then you'll always have point of entry based on 2019. And then if the new update actually changes the locations to your benefit, then you'll also get access to those areas, okay? So you're in this neat little space where you probably get the best of both worlds. Yeah? In which case, you'll have point of entry locations. If down the track, right, let's just go to the map and say, okay, so what's this, what's this town right there? Does anybody know, roughly? Yeah, is that Nambucca Head? No, what's this? Actually, let's go here, Burley Heads, right? Let's just say for argument's sake, Burley Heads is considered an outer metro, right? Entirely hypothetical, but it's on the fringe, so it might be Burley Heads, right? If Burley Heads in 12 months' time becomes a DPA region, right, because there's not enough GPs in Burley Heads for some reason, because everyone's lost their minds and moved away from the beach, right? If there's not enough GPs and it gets allocated to be DPA and you go, aha, like the idea of setting up a practice in or working in a practice in as a GP in Burley Heads and you do a day of work in Burley Heads when it's DPA, great. It'll be eligible work and it'll count as Rosso under the per day basis if you just do one day, right, probably. Then it becomes a quarantined location for you personally which means that if you keep working there, great. But if you have a break from working there, you'll always be eligible to return to that location. The point being that once you've established a clinical relationship with patients in that area, we want you to be able to come back and reestablish that, okay? In which case that becomes a quarantine location. So now we have all these concepts. So let me just summarize it all, okay? You'll always be able to work under the program MM7, Six, five, four, three, two, right? And MM1 outer metro if it's DPA or DWS, yeah? And across that, you'll have point of entry locations. And then based on your activities, you may establish quarantine locations as well. But just to be very clear, you'll never be able to work MM1 in a metro which is entirely consistent with the intent of the program to get doctors out of that location and more remote, right? Into Monto, an MM5 as a rural GP, okay? All right. Now, a little bit about what happens if you withdraw or if you don't meet your obligations to complete your return of service. But let me start with this by just giving you, sorry to tell you how to suck eggs, but this is often a little bit of a stumbling block for some people, how university places are funded overall, okay? Because there's a Commonwealth supported place element and then there's a HEX element, okay? These are two very different things. So let me explain that for you, just reinforce it for some, but explain it for others, okay? So the Commonwealth supported place element is the money that the federal government gives to the university to provide the infrastructure and the faculty and the course, et cetera, okay? And so essentially that's what the Commonwealth has invested to provide you with your com 
Commonwealth supported place and to provide extra places in medicine under the bonded medical program. Okay, so you get that Commonwealth supported place. Year in, year out, it's about $28,000 at the moment per year per person, right? So each of you, 28 grand from the federal government to the university, okay? On the other side, you have your HEX. And as I said earlier, the HEX component for medicine has come right down. And for some humanities degrees, it's come up such that there's a more narrow band across all university degrees about roughly what you're paying in HEX. I think that this year it's about $11,800, just shy of 12,000, okay? So dramatically different, but still a lot of money. So $12,000 a year, HEX, okay? And I assume how many of you are establishing a help debt to offset paying your HEX up front? Yeah, pretty much everybody, all right? So in about 10 minutes, I'm gonna talk you through the new program, which is called the Higher Education Loan Program, HELP, Debt reduction for health practitioners. New program, literally passed the parliament a couple of weeks ago, in which case this is a program that's going to completely forgive your help debt if you do certain work. Okay, so I'll talk you through that. All right. However, coming back, so we've got the Commonwealth supported element and we've got the HEX element. Okay, I'm not going to, be, I'm not going to talk about HEX under the bonded medical program anymore. That's for you to, to uh, actually work through. Okay. As far as your Commonwealth supported place element is concerned, that's the consequence of not completing your return of service. So if you get it, get to this 18th year and you've done nothing, then you have to pay back the Commonwealth supported place element for the four years of your degree, assuming that you could do four years. Okay, so that's roughly $110,000 that you're on the hook for if you don't do the return of service. Okay, we're not going to worry about that because you guys are all going to become rural GPs, okay, and meet your return of service obligation. However, withdrawal. Let's start with withdrawal and then I'll come back to the not completing your, your requirements. So you're in your first year, some second years, okay? So under the program rules, you have until the HEX census date at the university, which is kind of coming up in the next few weeks, yeah, roughly kind of 31st of March. So... Wow, next week, roughly, two weeks. So if you're in your second year, right? Hands up, second years, right? If you're in your second year, you have until the 30th of March to withdraw from the program, okay? And if you withdraw from the program with your first year, second year, starting your second year, if you withdraw from the program, first you have to understand that withdrawing from the program means that you're departing from your course of study in medicine right they're linked it's the same thing so if you withdraw from the program before the hex census date in your second year you don't have any liability right we just acknowledge it wasn't for you okay away you go you still have to pay your hex for that the component that you've accrued but you don't have any liability under the program and essentially we just part ways yeah you have to withdraw officially through the bonded return of service system and there'll be a communication but roughly you we part ways Okay, if you go beyond that hex census date, so for you folks here on the 31st of March, once you get past that date, there and you're still in the program in your second year after the hex census date, thereafter you are liable for the hex. Sorry, oh, yes, you're liable for your hex, you always will be. Let me start that again. If you go past the hex census date in your second year, then you would be, you would be, uh, liable for the Commonwealth supported place up to the point in which you withdraw. Okay, so if it's the 1st of April, 2023, okay, and it's your second year, then you'd have to pay back the Commonwealth supported place for first and elements of second, yeah? You could withdraw on the day you graduate, right? And on that day, if you withdraw, you would be liable for four years of your Commonwealth supported place. It would be a mental decision to do that because then you've got 18 years to navigate, right? And an 18 year kind of window, in which case life might change. And while you're thinking here, oh, I don't wanna go rural. I don't think I wanna do that. I'm just gonna pay back. Like life can change and you might be presented with an opportunity or you might kind of circumstances might change and you just go, right, off I go. And you might be able to tick it off because any return of service that you do then is prorated against that liability. 
So if you do half of it in the first intern residency years and you meet that cap, then you've already done half of your obligation and you've, you've, you've kind of diminished half of your liability. Does that all make sense? Yeah? So as I said in that outline before, again, you can make whatever plan you want. You can do it as much ineligible work you want as long as you've got a return of service plan, right? You can start your ROSO in that 15th year and work, you know, every, every day to get your three years in the last three years and you'll meet your obligation. But if you get to the 18th year, Mark, and you haven't done 156 weeks, you have to pay back on a pro rata basis your Commonwealth supported place. Yeah? The slight kind of silver lining to that dark cloud is that the Commonwealth supported place amounts are set for the year. So this year is about $28,000. They don't get indexed, so they don't go up over time, okay? In which case, your liability will be set for the 2023 year at $28,000, whatever it is, and change. And then each year that you study will remain the same, okay? In which case, if you want to, again, be that sad person that needs to get online and get all of the elements of the detail instead of participating in the fun activities that are available to you as a student at the University of Queensland, jump onto the education website, yeah? And you can see how it's calculated. You see the exact amounts. You could do a rough calculation. And indeed, I think you can do it within BROS if you're desperate to make us work on things that aren't really helpful to you. Okay. Where to go? Okay. The best source of advice and support for you as students is through our colleagues at Health Workforce Queensland who are going to come now, Meredith and Mark, or Mark and Meredith, however, um, to actually lead you through some of the work that they do as a rural workforce agency. Um, in, in, in essence, the Department of Health and Aged Care funds the rural workforce agencies to provide a very wide range of support to uh, the health system and to participants in the health system, mostly with a primary care focus, um, in which case these folks are going to come up and, and lead you through the Health Workforce Queensland elements for about 10 minutes and then we're going to get jump into some Q&A. Okay? Thanks, folks. Yeah, a round of applause is okay. workforce um, team leader with Health Workforce Queensland um, and uh, we're just going to provide you with a bit of an overview of who we are and what we do and why we're important to you but before I do that and introduce my colleague Mark I just wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands and um, where we meet today the Turrbal and Yagra peoples as the traditional custodians of these lands. Um, I also acknowledge uh, the presence of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders here today and online and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So um, I'll just hand over to Mark and let him introduce uh, himself and then we'll just talk a little bit about what we do as an agency and why it's uh, why we're important as part of your uh, journey through your rural health careers. Hello, everyone. I'm the uh, talent sourcing coordinator for uh, Health Workforce Queensland. I work under the banner through our Health uh, Workforce Solutions team. There's a lot of acronyms there, so I won't I won't bore you guys with it. Um, my my job is I overarch uh, four coordinators that look after four different regions. Uh, that specialize in those four different regions and have very special relationships with those communities in those regions as well. So my, my, my primary role is to build a candidate pool uh, where we can provide sustainable health care to those communities, to those regions, uh, through our regional coordinators, uh, building those relationships up with our students, with potential candidates, employers, and so forth. Awesome. Cool. So just to take a bit of a step back, um, as we've said, we are a rural workforce agency, but um, that means that we're a not-for-profit, non-government 
agency. However, we are funded, and this is where the connection is with the Department of Health and Aged Care. They fund us to provide the programs that we're going to talk about today that are especially important to you as a student. And then later on, that are especially important to you in terms of getting being part of the workforce. So we have that connection with the department. Um, and we also um, have a connection with the other jurisdictions, uh, states and territories in Australia. There is a rural workforce agency in each uh, state and territory, except for the ACT. So we come under different names, but I think just remembering Health Workforce Queensland today is, is enough. Um, so uh, that's just sort of us in a nutshell. Um, our objective is to provide our, our rural, remote and regional communities with health professionals across all disciplines. And um, that, that as a group um, within the agency that Mark and I are part of, there's about 40 of us that work there. We, uh, there's a number of teams, but just for today, the Future Workforce team, which is the students and the Health Workforce Solutions team, which looks after you once you want to be part of the workforce are the most important teams for you. Um, so uh, I don't think we need to go through why rural. Um, obviously, Benjamin has been uh, promoting rural to you. Um, and But I think I, I just really want to move straight into one of the programs that were, is a stepping stone into this journey. So this is particularly important for uh, the first year students, of which I think there were quite a few here uh, in, the, in the lecture uh, room, but I, hopefully there's some more online. This is uh, an opportunity, and um, I just want to preface this by saying don't make this a missed opportunity. This program is an opportunity for you to experience rural lifestyle, rural health uh, practice, and we've put this program together, which we call Grow Rural, especially for students. Um, it is a longitudinal program. It's, uh, we bring a group of students of 20 to 30 students together for once a year for three consecutive years. We visit nominated communities over the course of those three years. And we have just moved the uh, Grow Rural into coming out of being a rural immersion program into being a workforce solution program. So we're now also creating structured pathways for you into employment within those grow communities. So the this year there is an opportunity to be part of the Southwest Queensland Grow Program. Those um, students who are successful in coming onto the program, there are 20 places. Um, those students who are successful will visit the communities of Charleville, Roma, uh, Kanamala, St. George and Mitchell over the course of the three years. And you'll do that with, as I said, 20 other students, but those 20 students will be made up of all disciplines, nursing, midwifery, medical, speech pathology, OTs, social workers, psychologists, the whole, the whole broad range of disciplines that you will encounter as health professionals but also to give you an understanding that a, a patient's journey is made up of all disciplines and that as students, we learn to respect and to understand what other people's disciplines bring to um, the patient's journey, uh, health journey. The other a really important component of GROW as a program is it focuses on the importance of being part of a community, part of the community of you being part of a team, but part of the actual rural communities where you're welcomed in, um, you'll be billeted for one of the nights that you're actually in the, in, in the community, you're included in community-led activities, and also the local um, the health professionals that work in those communities will facilitate um, rural-based skill session scenarios for you. It's a very exciting program. It's extremely unique. 
uh, and we've it's been running since 2017. Uh, we've had one uh, cohort finish in central Queensland of m m over just coming over 70% of those students that have completed their uh, academic studies are now working rurally. So it's, as I said, this program is an opportunity. If you're not a first year student, I do encourage you to spread the word to other students who you know that are first years or um, people uh, in your uh, close networks. So that's the uh, Grow Rural program. Um, this is uh, the happy faces of the group of students that are part of it. Um, as I said, we all, we all get on a bus and we do a road trip and we travel to the communities together. So Southwest Queensland application round is opening on June the 1st. There are online information sessions uh, that will guide people through the kind of, there's an application round written if you, then you're, if you're successful in that, you proceed to an interview round. Um, Mark has here on him the QR code that takes you through to Health Workforce yes, Queensland. Correct. So um, if you want to um, get our website, that this is the man to see. Um, so as I said, the online um, sessions, I, I'll facilitate those and answer all questions about how to uh, get yourself through the application round. The next um, uh, second initiative I just want to briefly um, discuss with you is the Go Rural Virtually uh, series of um, interactive discussions that we have online. They're open. This is open to all students, all year levels, um, and it's free. And just sorry, I should have said Grow Rural is, does come at no cost to you as students. Everything is paid for, accommodation, uh, travel, food, everything is paid for, as is this. So we come together, we, um, we have an online inter, um, interactive discussions with health professionals um, covering a broad range of topics. We've covered mental health in the bush. We've covered uh, aggressive and violent um, behavior in healthcare settings. Um, so we try to cover topics that perhaps you don't uh, look at in depth within your studies. So just to let you know, the next Grow Rural virtually is happening on March the 28th, which is next Tuesday night. Uh, you can go online and register for that. Runs for about an hour and a half from 6 uh, to 7.30. The subject uh, for this next um, uh, session is closing the disability divide. And we have a number of really uh, outstanding speakers, one of whom I hope you already know, Dr. Dinesh, who works at the Gold Coast Hospital. Um, uh, he was involved in a motor vehicle accident and has since uh, become a quadriplegic and he, uh, but has managed to complete his studies and now uh, works in the hospital system. Um, so we have other um, speakers who have lived experience of disability as well as parents who have navigated the hospital and private um, uh, health systems. So this is an opportunity for you as students to come and ask questions of the people who are speaking. So as I said, it's an interactive discussion and to hear their stories. So that's an important um, um, part of your learning as well. And also to ask, is anybody here a member of Tropic? One. One, excellent. <laughs> oh, three. Um, so Tropic is your rural health club. That's an excellent opportunity for you to uh, connect. Um, and that it is another opportunity, an opportunity for you to connect with like-minded students, uh, especially for students who have um, come, who live out, come from the bush and now living here you know, to have people who are supportive and um, also doing their studies and to come together to do rural activities and as well as social activities. It's um, $20 for lifetime membership. Uh, so I do encourage you to join. Um, it's, it's an, and it's also a way of staying connected with Health Workforce Queensland. We, um, 
we fund um, as alongside with the Department of Health and Aged Care, we both uh, fund you to uh, do to run those activities. So we also connect through to you as students through that. So now I'm going to hand over to Mark. He'll just give uh, an overview of the Health Workforce Solutions team and how um, uh, how they will support you once you graduate. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Awesome. So you guys know that I'm the talent sourcing coordinator through uh, HWQ, HWS. Um, what I didn't tell you is the services that we may offer in terms of line of support. Um, obviously, Ben touched on how your return of service works. So I'm not going to bore you on that. What I'm going to explain to you is the type of support that we can provide through our team, especially through me. My, my primary role is not just to build a candidate pool, it's to actually provide a very... You know, I'm going to say support too many times, so I do apologise, guys. But it is what we what we do. We're not for profit. We're not your generic recruitment agency where we're charging twenty thousand dollars per practice. We're doing this because we love to do this. We love the community that we're supporting, and we expect that uh, we're getting that same passion from you guys as well. And we want to be able to share that passion. So when we're extending that 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 arm support for you, you're extending your arm support to those communities as well. So. Um, Think of us as a matchmaking service. It's probably a bad example uh, to use, but almost like Tinder Bumble, we're making sure that we're matching you up with the right, uh, you know, with the right practice. So that way you are well supported internally within that community through us and through any principal practice owners as well. Um, with the four regions, um, I did mention that they know that uh, our regional coordinators are very well connected within those regions. What I mean by that is we're not just speaking to them via Zoom calls. We're actually going out to those regions. We know the communities quite well. If you do ask us, you know, for example, what's Cairns like? I'm thinking about, you know, doing my return of service in Cairns, but I'm a bit scared of making the move from Brisbane. It's a huge move. We, I know we were talking about only short drives over to Bowie, but we do have other health services that, you know, we really employ you and invite you guys to explore as well. Get out of your comfort zone and really explore these, uh, these destinations. Uh, so when you do ask us questions, how's Cairns, for example, we will have someone like Caro, who's pretty pretty well versed in Cairns. She's she's just visited Cairns about two months ago. You just came from there as well. Yep. And she's also part of the Grow program in North yep. Queensland. So we have um, part, um, members of from Mark's team be part of the Grow. So that's also how you develop your your connections with us. Yeah. So you'll find that we'll have very close uh, close knit connections with the, the local PHNs, yep. uh, local network of community schools, shopping malls, anything that you guys need to actually be a part of, we'll be able to connect you through to. It's beyond the role. We understand that. It's a lifestyle change, just like Ben said. You start not just as a doctor, you're going to start from school, there's the kids, relationship, oh, sorry, relationship, the kids is not going to go on the grass like that. I did. Um, we understand that you guys have lives and we need to be able to tailor to that. It's beyond a profession. It's your whole life, you know? So we try to encompass that as well. Um, well now, in terms of support for us, please scan this. Please find me at the end of the, uh, uh, the discussion, the presentation today. I've got business cards, quite friendly. So I, I really do employ you and invite you guys to introduce yourself to me. I'm, I know I'm going to do that to you. I'm sorry. I'm loud. I'm extroverted. So. Um, I want to know the students that are passionate. I'm passionate about this work, and I can see it in, in the room here that you guys are equally as passionate. So um, I'm going to force my invite on you guys and hand out some business cards. I'm probably the least relevant person you want to speak to right now, being in recruitment. But remember us when you guys get through to the end of your journey, and I'll make sure that we are going to provide that channel of support for you. And I'm here for the next step. Yes. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, is that work on? Okay. Um, so, yeah, folks. The department, the university, the rural workforce agency, the um, health club, the rural clinical school are all here to support you to get through your studies, to plan your future work um, and to complete your return of service, all right? We wanna make it as easy for you as possible.
what questions do you have? Yeah, okay. Um, we might get a couple of runners to take a, um, somebody help me with, uh, Annie, you'd mind? Yeah, just take that up to the back, folks, and we'll just um, we'll just deal with it. So, folks are happy to. Uh, I might just pick up any um, legacy scheme participants. We'll answer the questions at the end if you folks want to come and and do it. But happy, happy for it to be a general question. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I was just wondering, with our return of service, does it have to be in Queensland, or can we do it interstate in the MM two to seven? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, no, you're not restricted at all across Australia. Okay, I'd say given you're studying here and you're going to have clinical placements in rural settings, potentially during your studies, then build a relationship with your folks to start with, see where that first job might be. It's obviously an easier transition into a, maybe a Queensland health role, but no, you're not restricted at all. Can I okay. Ask? Yep. Yeah. You know, just because I work out of Queensland doesn't mean I talk to the other, I don't talk to the other RWAs. We actually work quite conducively with each other. So if you do have an interest in working externally out of that, I'm not going to just, you know, fob you off and say, no, I can't help you out. I'm definitely going to help you out. If you can make a positive impact towards, you know, a much needed community, of course, I'm going to help you out. And you can the right direction. Yeah. And indeed, there might be opportunities for you to actually tie in with, if you're from a different state and you've got an interest in a different state, whatever, there, as Meredith had outlined, there's opportunities to get sponsorship to attend conferences you might be able to access that from other states as well if you've got an intent to go there. So the, the more you work in uh, uh, exploring options and understanding opportunities through Health Workforce Queensland and in all of our information, you referred to the RWA network across Australia. Yeah, Meredith did mention that there isn't an RWA in the ACT, but we get serviced by, the ACT gets serviced by the New South Wales region. So that support is available to ANU students, Australian National University, but to you if you want to work in the Canberra region. Yeah. Okay. So other questions? Thanks very much. Yeah. Annie, if you can just take that up, we'll continue and we will get some online. Um, Becky, if there are some online, so I'll come to that next. Um, just for that, um, Bross, the six months, how we have to log in every time. Yep. Does that start now-ish when we sign or afterwards? And what happens if you don't log in? within six months. Okay, so um, the to start with, you once you become a bonded participant, as in if you're a first year and you haven't you haven't yet got your BROS logon details, so you're not actually a bonded participant yet, okay? You have to accept your place before the 30th of June, but we definitely want you to do it before that. You know, you're demonstrating your commitment being here that you're gonna study medicine, jump in, consider the the, the guidance material, which is all consistent and the reason why we're here to support you in making that choice and staying in the program and staying studying medicine, right? So that's when you become a bonded participant. Once you are a bonded participant, you're subject to those reporting obligations, okay? And if you look more deeply at the rule, you have an obligation to report and to log into BROS every six months. And if you fail to do that, you may be subject to an administrative penalty which is $1,000, okay, for each failure. So it does become a significant thing if you don't stay in touch and if you don't update your details and if you don't confirm with us over time. And then it gets more serious if you don't confirm your return of service plan and you don't confirm the work you've done within the deadlines, you'll continue to be subject to that administrative penalty of $1,000 and you risk some of the work that you do not being recognised as completed return of service. Okay, so we're making the system available to you. We're making it as easy as possible. And the system will give you reminders to actually log in and to do it. Okay, if you're recalcitrant and don't do it, then that's really our only mechanism to actually get you back on track is to give you that $1,000 penalty. We don't want to do it. We haven't done it to anyone yet. We don't want to start with University of Queensland participants. Okay, five minutes every six months, I swear. Yeah, a little bit more in your last unit of study and then a little bit more once you're actually in the workforce, dependent on how you're working and very light touch if you're full-time and part-time, a little bit more admin if you're going to work on a, on a flexible basis, okay? Um, I just wanted to seek clarification about um, things like the scheme where you're... 
No, the um. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, because in our internship, we're before we get into doing our specialization, we get eighteen months to do the return of service. Um, and then the do we still get access to scaling then if we do the eighteen months do our specialization and then like go back to do the return of service because that's not really a continued 24 months of full-time work in an MM4 four to seven. Sure. I think, I think what I'm hearing, so let me just reshape what your question is. It's so you can do 18 months or 78 weeks of your Rosso pre-fellowship, right? You can, if you choose, right? It's not that you have 18 months to do it. It's that you can do it pre-fellowship you can do up to 18 months and then you get a cap. So if you do the first 78 weeks in 78 weeks, good luck to you, but then you can't do any more until you fellowed or you get to that 12 year mark. Okay, so that's half before fellowship, half after fellowship. And then the 12 years is just a, for, for people who don't fellow. Okay, so that's one eligibility and one set of rules, right? Then the scaling is separate to that, right? So to be eligible for scaling, you have to build up 104 weeks of full-time, 35 hours a week, and also in an MM4 to 7 location, okay? Once you've built up that, regardless of whether you do 78 weeks up front, right, or you do your 104 in accordance with the other rules, once you get to 104 weeks, and of course then it would have to be post fellowship, because you have to do at least six months of that, you know, if you do 18 months before, then you have to do another six months post fellowship, right, or post 12 years to get to your 104 full time weeks, you're with me? Yeah. And once you're eligible, because you've done 104 weeks on a of full time in an MM four to seven location, then any future work that you do on a full time basis in an MM four to seven, will accrue the scaling benefit and will essentially count as two weeks of Rosso. Right. So you're you following have me? to do the 24 months consecutive. No, no, no. And <laughs> none, of, none of your Rosso, none of your Rosso has to be consecutive week in, week out. Yeah. It can be one week here, one week there. It can be one hour here, one hour there. It's just that it becomes a bit more administratively burdensome for you to track all of that and put it into the system if you work really flexibly. Okay. And I might add that it doesn't have to be in the same location. It can be in multiple locations at any one time, provided that it's full time. You're doing at least 35 hours in that week in a MM4 to 7 location. Okay. All good? Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I just can, had can, a Sorry, folks. Sorry to interrupt. Can you just introduce yourself to the group? Because I know you're all getting to know each other. And so just start with I am whoever, and then, then we'll get to know who, who you are. Uh, I'm Sally. Um, I'm a first year med student. Um, I'm just wondering if you are a specialist or like you've attained your fellowship and you were saying like, say you do uh, neurosurgery or something and you want to go and work as a rural generalist, can you still do that? like after can you just like get a um you were saying like you can just go and work in the clinic um for a day or whatever or six months or whatever it is like can you just get a job as a rural generalist after your fellowship yeah you provided you are allowed to work in within that scope of practice then and it's eligible work then it would be eligible Okay, so yeah, if you go down the specialization pathway and you want to become a surgeon, etc., but you can't find a job doing that chosen specialty in an eligible location, right, then yes, you can work in a different role within your scope of practice and in an eligible location. Yeah, and if you want to work as a neurosurgeon for four days a week in Brisbane City, and then travel out to Toowoomba and do a different role or do clinics, as long as you've got those, you know, you can demonstrate the work that you are doing is eligible and it's in an eligible location, then yes, you can, you can chip away at that, right? But if you, if you think that you're going down one of those really specialized pathways where it is going to be difficult for you to get your chosen job in an eligible location, 
then that just reinforces the benefit to you of front loading and doing as much rural practice early as possible. Because then you'll have 50% of your ROSO done in those first years. Then you can do your vocational training and then you've only got 50% of your liability to chip away at. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then for the DPA and DWS locations, yep. do you have to be on a GP pathway to access those or like do you have to be attaining your GP fellowship or do you, can you just access that anytime? No, no, not anytime. So DPA is once you're on that pathway and DWS is once you're on that pathway. Okay, so of clearly, if you're on a GP pathway, yeah. then it's going to be a DPA that you're going to access. Yeah, okay. if you're on a non -D, non GP pathway, then it will be DWS. It's either it's one or the other. It's not both because it's unlikely that you're going to at any one time or over the course of your career be on both of those pathways and attain both of those fellowships. And so then, uh, in your first three years, when you're not on any pathway, you're just intern and like the rest of it for the first three years do, you don't you can't access that no it's just mm2 to seven okay yeah yeah thank you but if i showed you the whole map of all of australia we're talking 99.9 percent .9 of australia is eligible work yeah yeah eligible location great thank yeah? you thanks sally great questions and for everyone else who's asked a question but let's let's Yeah, that's right. So yeah, because you can automatically be eligible for MM7 through 2, you don't have to worry about whether that's DWS or D DPA because it's automatically eligible MM7 to 2, right? It was a lot more tricky under the other schemes because they used to only be work, post-fellowship, you could work MM4 to 7 or DWS, in which case it was a lot more tricky. It's a lot simpler to just say, you just can work 2 to 7, and then in some circumstances, you can work DPA, DWS, you know, out, out of Metro, as Annie said. Thanks, Annie. Okay, so I think we're tra transitioning down this great line. Hi, yeah, my name's Sophia. I was just wondering, I think I missed the part on the point of entry location. Was yep. that referring to on the day of accepting the program, all eligible locations, they remain eligible? Was that it? That's right. So on the day you accept your place. So when you log into BROS for that first time and you tick that box that says, I accept my place in the bonded medical program and you become a bonded participant by definition under the legislation, on that day, all the locations that were eligible, whether they were MM2 to seven on that day or whether they were DPA and DWS on that day, right in those outer metro locations, MM1 outer metro, they will always be eligible for you. And BROS will always remember that you came in on that day and these were the locations that were eligible, right? And that's why it could be different. If you take until the 30th of June, right, then really you're just delaying and might be minim like, you know, the, the point of entry locations may change, right? So get in as early as possible and then you'll be able to not only accrue those as point of entry, but then as other things come online during your next 22 years, we're going to be hanging out for 22 years, right? Four years of uni and 18 years of ROSO, right? Then any changes that are made to those eligible locations, you'll continue to accrue those benefits, yeah? And when something, something comes online as a DPA or DWS and you work there, then it will always be quarantined for you to, to continue working there, okay? That answer your question, Sophia? Yeah, I did have another one actually. Um, so in terms of the fellowship, are we so we do the half of it before the fellowship and half only after we've obtained the fellowship or yep. also while we're in our fellowship training? no no so you can complete half of your return of service obligation prior to attaining fellowship so on the day that they say you are done right that's the point at which you can do half before and half after okay you can do it as fast as you want the 78 weeks, you can do 78 weeks in 78 weeks, or you can take 78 week. you can do 78 weeks over those years from when you finish your medical degree to when you attain fellowship, which is probably going to be roughly six to seven years 
for a, a GP or a rural generalist and maybe a bit more depending on your chosen specialty, right? Or, yeah, that's right. Or you can do it all after fellowship or you can do it all after 12 years, right? But don't. <laughs> Go rural, <laughs> become GPs. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Alison. I'm a yep. second year medical student. Um, as bonded participants, are we eligible when we work rural and remote for other like incentive programs by the government, like the workforce incentive program? Yeah. Thank you. Great question. Yeah. Right. Um, for the most part, right, under the bonded medical program as a bonded participant, we don't put any restrictions on you on other things that you participate in. Right. However, you need to understand the specific eligibility requirements of that other program. And just to be con to confirm, because there are state government programs that we don't administer. There are particular incentives that require you to do eligible work that is slightly different to the bonded medical program, in which case you need to understand what are the restrictions or opportunities in order to ensure that you're not precluded as a bonded participant under that program. Yeah, I'm not aware of Commonwealth programs that says if you are a bonded participant in the bonded medical program, you cannot access, right? But it might be... For example, somebody in one of the other programs, I think it was in Wollongong or one of those other unis um, in, on, you know, south from here, we had somebody that was participating in a defence force program. And so I don't know, and he didn't know, whether they preclude him from doing his return of service at the same time, right? That's probably a nice segue into the higher education loan program debt reduction for rural doctors and nurse practitioners. Will I talk you through that? Yeah? Okay. Because that's a program that bonded medical program participants are eligible for without question, right? So some of the people here in the room were the architects of that program, my, myself specifically. Okay, so that program, again, remember when I was talking about the higher, sorry, the Health Insurance Act and the bonded medical program rule? Okay, that's a health program. That's roughly how health programs work. In this space, because the higher education loan program is an education portfolio program, that program is established under the Higher Education Support Act and the Minister for Education will issue the Help Debtor Health Practitioner guidelines to administer, to determine who is specifically eligible and who is uh, how we administer that program, we being the Commonwealth, but the Department of Education with support from health. Okay. So let me back up there a little bit because the Act has been amended to establish the program. Okay. That's done. Received royal assent on the 20th of February. So that is, it is going to be a program, right? What has to happen now is that the Minister for Education in, with support from his department, it is a him, Jason Clare, Minister for Education. He needs to issue the guidelines and will have a role in, in advising in that process, in which case I can now speak about the intent of the program as was funded by the former government and that this government has agreed to continue. Right? I can talk about the intent, but given I'm not the Minister for Education, okay, I can't determine what will be the, in the guidelines but roughly we can advise. Yeah? So the intent of the program is that if you have studied a course of study, a course of study in medicine as defined under the Act, right? So you are doing it, right? You do that course, you uh, accrue a help debt, offsetting the requirement to pay your hex up front. So you get a help debt, okay? They're two creed criteria, right? So you're gonna meet them, right? Thereafter, once you get to PGY3, so three years postgraduate, right? Thereafter, if you work doing roughly the clinical work that we've talked about and roughly the effort that we've talked about, 20, 20, 20 odd hours a week, right? If you do in an MM3 to five, you have to do the length of your degree. So for you folks, mostly four years, MM3 to five. If you go MM6 to seven, you only have to do half the length of your degree. Two years for you folks, right? 
So let's back up a little bit. Study for four years. Don't pay back your help debt. Okay? Because you want to have the preserve as much as possible to be offset. Right? And we'll relieve it. Right? So don't make any voluntary payments. Trust us, we're from the government. Amass the maximum help debt, right? I'll come to compulsory payments in the tax system and you'll probably be familiar with that already, but let me come back to that. But amass the help debt for your four years of study, right? Under bonded, go rural, right? Start your return of service, right? Do your return of service and maybe you get to that cap of, you know, 78 weeks and then you get to PGY3, right? Then you can start work under the help program. And if you are in an MM3 location, right? So think about your bonded. If you go MM2 early and then you stay in MM2, then you're not going to be eligible for help yet, right? So we want you to go a little bit more rural, right? So to establish yourself, think about in bonded terms, think about establishing yourself MM3 and then it would be eligible for bonded in the early part. And then you could stay there and start your help work, right? So... Do you study? Do your early bonded return of service, rural, right? Intern, residency year, you might get to the cap, great, right? Then PGY3, then you have to stay MM3 to five for four years. And now we're at seven years, so you're probably just about going to be in, in the space of fellowing, right? Rural generalist, um, GP, right? primary care and thereafter you can finish off your bonded return of service yeah in which case give or take eight eight and a half years and if it's full time and you can access scaling seven and a half years you can be free of your bonded return of service and free of your health debt pretty good yeah so i'm coming to get a beer off you at that nine-year mark when we've paid back you we've given you relief for your help debt is that helpful yeah okay so once the minister for education has finalized the guidelines and the department of education has built their application system and we'll be supporting you with information on our website kind of like we do for bonded and i don't know if we'll run these sessions but we're, we're trying to design these so that they complement each other yeah the point being that we want you to be able to establish rural, stay rural, right? And so we've got a structural mechanism in the bonded program that you have to return your service, but then it does complement with other incentive programs, this being a key new one, where if you do the work that's required to accrue the benefits under that program, we can kind of almost see how it all patches together so that you can do your return of service and stay and establish yourself in rural medicine, okay? But to your point, sorry, I lost your name. Um, Alison. Alison, yeah, thanks, Alison. Just getting back to other programs like the Workforce Incentive Program and others, then I'm not as familiar with the requirements of those programs. So I'm not going to speak authoritatively, but we don't prevent bonded participants from accessing those other incentive programs. But it's always worth talking about it, and you can follow up with us and and, and our colleagues across the division to to give you a more authoritative answer on that. Okay. Other questions, folks. I think Becky. Have we got online questions? And just remind me what time the catering is going to be here. Um, I think it's here now. Okay, great. We've yep. got a few more So can we just answer yeah. a couple online? Because I know that these folks have been waiting very patiently and uh, we should check in with them. Yeah, will we go in the meantime? Yep, I'll, we'll just bring it in next. Okay, yep, go ahead. Hi, um, my name's Noah. Um, so I was wondering, with the 20 hours part-time, if you go above that 20 hours but don't make that 35-hour benchmark, does those extra hours accumulate um, or does that stay as just the 20 hours you make one week of the... Yeah, yeah. yeah so the 20 hours is a threshold. It's yeah. a minimum. And once you go over 20, then you get a week, right? Okay. And if it's more between 20 and 35, it's still a part-time week. If it goes beyond 35, then it's a full-time week. But again, the full-time week only really matters when it comes to working in an MM4 to 7 location for yeah. the scaling benefit. All right. If I had a time machine and I could have written the act and the rule from the outset, 
this would have been probably a little bit different. So I can appreciate it's a bit tricky to understand. Yeah. The key thing is you can never earn more than a week of Rosso in a one week period, right? So really that whole idea of banking hours and the like, it only becomes relevant for the per day basis to recognize that there are scenarios where you can do valuable work that should be able to be counted as return of service work, yeah? And otherwise they're just minimum thresholds, okay? I'm gonna come back to you in just a second, but we're gonna go online first. Okay, can everyone hear me? Um, we have a few. Um, I think some of them might have already been answered, um, but I'll just go through them anyway. Um, so regards to the six month credit, does the first 104 weeks of full-time work have to be done straight or is it referring to the first 104 weeks as banked? And does that mean that if you do any part-time weeks in the first 104 weeks, you are not eligible for credit? No, no, certainly not anything to do with not being eligible. So as I said before, you're not restricted in how you work. So you can do a per day week, right? And then you can do a part-time week and then you can do a full-time week and then you can get back to it. However you do it, once you meet the criteria to be awarded a week of Rosso, it gets credited and you've got one, two, however many towards your 156, right? So any work that you do gets you on that path towards the magical 156, right? You have to do and accrue 104 of those on a full-time basis in an MM4 to 7, right? Regardless of how you go about it, you might do it periodically, you might do a 78 pre-fellowship and then straight away after fellowship do another 26, like however you do it, or you might do it one week every month, you know, you know, up to the cap and then beyond. However you do it, you just have to accrue 104 weeks on a full-time basis in an MM4 to 7 location. So those special weeks of Rosso, and thereafter any work you do on a full-time basis in an MM4 location would count double. However, if you've done most of your work on a full-time basis, but you've got a few dotted weeks where you did a part-time or you did a per day, whatever, then eventually you might in that last period where you were eligible for the scaling two for one, you might only have to do 20 of those weeks to get 40 credit because you already did 16. Does that make sense? Yeah, roughly how it will work. Once you get into BROS and you'll see the bar and you see your plan and you can see, because any plans you put in say, these are the weeks that you would accrue and the system will tell you, yeah, yeah, you've got a contract for two years, which is 104 weeks, but it's only eligible for 78 because you'd get to the cap, right? All of these things, as soon as you see it in BROS, you just go, oh yeah, it all makes sense. Okay, great question. Bit of a tweak to the question that we had before. So thanks, Becky, let's keep going. Could you please outline the obligations that we need to do as fourth year students or point us in the right direction of where to find that information? Okay, so just, this is a fourth year student fourth year who student. wants to know what their obligations is in their last year. Yes. Of study. Yeah. Okay, great. So this is, as a bonded participant, you have to meet your reporting obligations. So you have to log into BROS every six months and confirm that your, your contact details are correct and that your trajectory towards completing your course of study is correct. Okay. If it hasn't changed, you're just logging in essentially and logging back out. Okay. If your details have changed, you update them. In your last year of study though, you have to be getting into that ROSO planning phase, right? So you're thinking about what are eligible locations and when am I going to work there, right? It doesn't have to mean you have to tell us where you're going to be working on your first day after you've completed your course of study. You just have to have a plan of when you will do some return of service. And as I said, that could be in 12 years time. It could be in 10 years time. It could be literally the first day of your internship, right? If you've done that, if you've got a ROSO plan in BROS the day before you complete your course of study in medicine, you've met your obligations. It's that easy. You know, you might want to have parallel plans. You might be wanting to talk to the health workforce agency about different opportunities. You might be fastidious and want to map out every day of your life for 18 years if you want and have 40 plans, okay? But I'm telling you, almost all of them are going to change, yeah? Because you're going to maybe have a child. You might have another child. You might meet somebody. You might move to France. You might whatever, 
right? So your focus is on your obligation, which is before you finish your course of study, you have to have a ROSO plan in BROS. Simple. And when you get in the system, literally you can do it in five minutes. Monto, 1st of January, 2027. 1st of January, 2028, intern year, sweet, you're done. In fact, that was what, 17 seconds. Any more? There's a few, if we okay. have time. Keep, keep uh, rolling. Keep rolling. Um, so if you do your speciality training in a rural location, for example, Toowoomba, would that only be counted as 18 months maximum because it's counted as pre-fellowship? Yeah. So if you are doing eligible work prior to the day that the college says you are a minted specialist, you can do a maximum of 78 weeks. Yeah. In which case, yeah, if you are, I mean, this scenario sounds like, okay, I'm not going to do, I'm going to work in a metro. I'm going to work at the Marta Hospital here in Brisbane. I'm going to do my internship and my residency, and I'm not going to do any ROSO under the bonded program for the first three years. Yeah. Then I'm going to get onto my specialization pathway and then I'm going to move to a rural location and I'm going to start chipping away because I'm doing eligible work in an eligible location in my pre-vocational phase of that training. In that, that case, that might be about three to four years. And in that three to four years, you could do your 78 weeks, right? That sounds to me what they're saying. So yes, you can do a maximum of half your ROSO, 78 weeks of 156, that math is right. I've been saying it a lot over the last four months to 20 different universities. Now I've just got to check myself. Okay, yes, 78 is the maximum. Yeah, okay, that's great. Back in the room, Noah, could you just hand the, unless you've got another question, I okay, go again. Um, so with that, when we create a plan, Yep. wherever we say we might be going, let's say I put in a preference for my internship year. And then when I'm applying to do my internship and preference in different places is that plan shared and going to influence my preference in um, no so um there are some circumstances in which being a bonded participant might add to the weighting in your consideration different per, per, um, areas the universities in wa you tick a box to say i am a bonded participant and then you get preference for their rural clinical placements right yeah. so Different states and different universities have different operations. Now, some of you folks, from what we've heard from Claire and others in the rural clinical school, you're going to do some of your work in those areas, right? So when it comes to working in those areas, you might have a bit of a leg up because you've met the staff, you've operated in the hospital, you know, they know you, they know that you're a star, Noah, and that might count in your favour. But as far as we're concerned in the department or the bonded medical program, you demonstrate that you've got a plan. And that tells us that you're thinking about your obligation and it satisfies us that you're on a path to delivering it and we're supporting you, but it doesn't get shared. It doesn't go outside of the system. The only people who can get access to your record with your consent are the Rural Workforce Agency because they're going to work with you to understand what, where you're at, what your obligation is, what your interest is, and how they can support you to get a placement, right? But they're the kind of partnerships that we're investing in. As far as what you do with the, the, the university and what you do with Queensland Health or another health service, that's for you and them to work through. Yeah, we wouldn't be granting them access to the BROS. Okay. Yep. Thanks. All right. Um, hey, I'm Shrey. So with the consequences thing, so you said it's the CSP element, right? Yep. So let's say it's 30K per year, 120K for the whole uh, four years. Um, if we do... Do not do the ROSO at all for the entire 18 years. Just pay that out. Does it reflect some sort of a bad professional record? Because we just want to stay metro. No, it's just your decision. Yeah. I mean, it's a, I say it's a consequence because, yes, it is a consequence if you don't do your return of service, right? But it's your decision to withdraw. It's your right to withdraw. You can withdraw up to the HEX census state in your second year with no liability right you're free and clear we just part ways if it's afterwards then incrementally you just have to pay back the csp yeah because i mean the philosophy being you've taken up a place in a program and we've invested in you to do that right and our goal in making that offer was to get a doctor in the bush right and if you either withdraw in this phase yeah or you chose to stay metro 
and not do that return of service, then you're not holding up your end of the bargain and you have to pay it back, right? That's the consequence. But it's your choice as well, right? If for whatever reason you can't or don't return service, and then you're working in the health system as a neurosurgeon and probably earning a pretty hefty sum, and you go, well, actually, it doesn't suit my family or it doesn't suit my practice to move away, then that's, that's, that's it. You pay back the Commonwealth supported place. That's, that's how it will work. But it is prorated for any return of service that you have done up to that point. Yeah. Yep, um, over here. And does the CFD go after the patient? No, no, it doesn't. Okay. So it's set. Yeah. No. That's why I say it would be a mental decision to withdraw prior, right? Because you're going to pay in twenty, twenty-three dollars, twenty-eight thousand. You, you know, it's. But don't go rural. Go rural. Okay, who else has got a question? I, I'm literally standing between you and the lunch that's been provided. Yeah, that's not to offset any questions you have. I will stay for as long as you want to ask questions. Okay, but we might actually in, let's say in another five minutes, I'll answer three more questions and then we'll move into the catering and then you can come and bug me or my colleagues that can answer your questions, okay? Um, I've got some more questions, but they're related to the um, the, the previous like BMP legacy, yep. legacy programs. So. Okay, so who were those folks again who were bonded 2019 or earlier? I think we had a couple of hands earlier. Yeah, okay. What's your name? Uh, Henry. Henry, make a beeline for Matthew Bolters. Okay, yeah. Okay, he's going to answer all your questions. Okay, and if he can't answer it, then you're going to come to Pat Yannick. Okay, who I might add is our boss um, and runs the program proper. All right. Any more? Yes. One more online, or a few more online? Um, we do have one that just uh, a student that just came late. So um, they're just asking for the Rosso after fellowship um, or specialization. Is it based on DWS of the year we sign the contract rather than the MM category, MMM. Yeah, so just to, just to confirm, my answer is that this is a person who is a bonded participant in the bonded medical program, okay? If, if that's the case, once you have achieved fellowship, you can work MM7, to two or two to seven. And if a location is either a DPA or DWS at the time that you're doing your eligible work, then it you can also, if that's an inner, sorry, if that is a MM1 outer metro location, then that would also be an eligible location. This all assumes that it meets the criteria of what is eligible work being the, the clinical kind of, you know, patient facing service delivery. So just recapping, Post fellowship, and this is the case pre fellowship as well, you can always work MM two to seven. Okay. Once you are on the pathway or achieve fellowship in a particular specialty, if it's a GP, then you can be eligible for DPA areas outer metro. And if it's a non GP specialty, you can be eligible for a DWS location. Okay. And once you've done that work, once you've done that work in that location, you can quarantine that location going forward. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's it. Oh, sure. Yeah. So it has to be DWS for that specialty, not for a specialty. It has to be for that specialty. Yeah. So there's 43 different specialties of which DWS is characterized. And again, Bross knows which specialty you load into the system based on your characteristics, in which case it gives you the correct answer for your specialty. Okay. All right. We're going to wrap it up there. Folks, um, once again, congratulations on getting your place. I know that there's a whole lot of hard work to get you here. Thank you for, in a couple of weeks, accepting your place in the bonded medical program. Okay. And I, just reiterating that we are here to support you to meet your obligations during the student phase and to support you to get roles and to meet your return of service. Okay. We are friendly. We will help. And uh, we wish you luck in meeting your obligations. But if you want to come and have a sandwich or whatever it is, piece of pizza, whatever we've um, provided, um, come and ask us some more questions if you're a bit, bit shy um, and we'll endeavor to answer those. But in future, you'll be able to get access to all this information on our website. So come and get 
your link into. Take one of these away because you might have colleagues that couldn't be here today. And always come back to the website um, to get the information. And um, we will support you to meet your obligations. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you, Becky. Yeah, that'd be great. So just be clear. Um, yeah, yeah.